I'd like to ask everybody to stand up. I, if, if it's comfortable for you to stand, please stand for a minute. This church voted to hold service until 1230. Yes. Because. So, that's why. You stand. <laughs> If you want to turn around and give somebody an elbow bump right now, greet, greet one another in the Lord, would you? If you're new here, elbow bump, fist bump, hug. <laughs> Praise the Lord. A lot of fanatics out there thought I'd do the more than just one person. You may be seated. Thank you so much. <clears throat> My question is, where is your safe place? And after the invasion of the Congress on last Wednesday, January 6, Emily Cochran reported, I was in the house chamber and heard the rioters trying to get in. I saw guns drawn. Oops. This is me again. I actually saw guns drawn. I knew there was a breach. But it only had been in the aftermath when you step back and see the photos from across the building that it really hits home how much worse it could have been. And it underscored how dangerous last Wednesday was and how dangerous things could still become. The National Guard are preparing for the possibility that something might happen again. In the Capitol building this past Wednesday, January 13th, 2021, Emily Cochran, a congressional reporter for the New York Times, shot this early morning picture. Those men had been there all night. My question again is, where is your safe place? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please send your Holy Spirit to guide us today, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Well, in about 1978, 70, 78 probably, I was studying about the catching away, the rapture, trying to figure out if it was before or after the tribulation. The church I went to believed that no problem, one day Jesus will come back, catch you all up in the air, and uh, you don't have to worry about anything, you're just going to be raptured out. And it, on top of that, it was a secret. So we wanted to uh, study that. So when I studied it, this scripture came up. And as you can see it on the screen, it says from Matthew 24, verse 29 and 30, it says immediately when? After the tribulation. Of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall, give no, shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear what? The sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see what? The Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Wow, was I shocked. And what was going to happen to me during this time of trouble, trouble, this time of tribulation? There was a man that was on the radio. And he was uh, pretty much telling people, we've got some property out here in Arkansas. You should go ahead and get you some. And uh, you should get a diesel car because diesel fuel lasts longer than regular gasoline. And then he said that he was, um, every time he shaved, he only used his razor once and then he put it in a, in a steam trunk so he'd have enough razors to shave during the time when all this bad stuff was going to happen. He was doing the same with toothbrushes. <laughs> And, and it was like, where are you gonna, how are you gonna survive? How are you gonna survive? Should we believe this guy? Well, the scripture was more solid than what the man on the radio was saying, and he was very much in a minority. Not very many people were talking about that. So, 
I was scared. Scared in a way like I thought I knew what I was supposed to be doing to serve the Lord, but now this was a different, different story. What should I do? And so the following is a dream that the Lord gave to me personally to show me where is my safe place. And I hope you'll tolerate my trying to tell you my dream. <clears throat> I was going to school in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, you can barely see that, but there's a, you see that clover leaf in the middle there? Frequently I traveled that way if I was uh, coming from the south and went north, and uh, Highway 75 interstate, intersects with uh, Interstate 44, and that clover leaf right there where you see the red dot, there was a YMCA camp. Well, I never knew about it, really. But I had this dream. I guess I had just found out that there was a YMCA camp there, and the Lord used it in my dream. Um, you see it in the lower right-hand corner. There it was. But look at where it is. I mean, it's like highway, highway, and then there's this, this space, this camp, this ground. So that struck me in this dream. And there was a building. There was a building there. But I found myself in the dream, like in a hallway, like of my old elementary school. And if you've ever been in the basement of one of those hallways at an old elementary school, it looked a little like this, kind of narrow, kind of dark and a little weird. And there I was, standing in this hallway, of like my old elementary school. But then, down the hallway, rushing down the hallway, all wet and muddy, comes this mudslide, whew, all the way up, almost got to me, and then it stopped. And I'm thinking, what on earth is this? A mudslide on this building, and I'm in this YMCA camp, and what is going on? It's a dream. And it was. It was like, oh, this is a landslide that's covered up this whole building, and this mud has just come down the hallway this way. And I realized, I said to myself, we're, I'm, we're trapped inside this building. And then... If you remember, back in the 60s, the fallout shelter concept was that mud would protect people from atomic radiation. And so I was thinking, okay, this whole building is covered with mud. Maybe, maybe there's going to be problems in you know, the tribulation. There's going to be nuclear bombs. What's going to be part of this tribulation? Oops. And then there was this man standing there. I didn't see him before, but he was there. And I, and I said, we're trapped. And he said, oh, don't worry. I've been laying up food here for about a year. And I thought, and then I saw that there were other people there too. So he was right. He'd been laying up food for about a year. And I was like, well, okay, this bad stuff is happening. We're all covered up with mud in this building. There's food and there's probably some kind of source of oxygen. But then the most important thing happened. I looked over to the side and when I looked to the side, I saw this, this guy standing by a microphone, and he was uh, preaching, talking, playing his guitar, singing. And I recognized in my dream who it was. I recognized that it was Jonathan Gansborough. And he, had, he was a converted recording artist. And he had started an organization called World Shakers for Christ. What do you think of that name? Sounds like a quiet ministry, right? World Shakers for Christ, and one of the things about about this guy is he had a minor recording artist, uh, uh, you know, contract before he gave his life to God, before he changed his life, wasn't on drugs anymore, and God did this thing for him that he wanted to reach the young people. So he had a coffee house there in Tulsa, and because I played the guitar a little bit, not as good as our brother, but I played the guitar a little bit and wrote some songs. I used to go to that coffee house and sing, and then people would be on the street, and they would talk to the young people that were out there by some kind of arcade. I don't think they had video games yet in this year, uh, 1978, maybe just starting. And, and so they would talk to people, and they'd say, come on in, come on into the uh, coffee house. Well, you can have something to, to eat and to drink, and there's a, a performer up on the stool in the front, you know, it's come on in. And then people would witness out on the street to these young people. And Jonathan had made this possible that this building was rented and that the organized young people would go out and do this kind of witnessing. 
It was frontline witnessing. So here I am looking over at this person standing by the microphone, knowing I'm in this place that's covered with mud, protected, there's food and everything, and I see, I know who that is. That's Jonathan, more famous than I knew him. And I, I got this thought went through my mind. And the thought was, if you are on the front lines for me, you will be at the right place at the right time. Amen. That's stuck in my mind. So much so that I remembered it when I woke up. And here's the rest of it. If you are on the front plate, front lines for Jesus, you will be at the right place at the right time. Amen. Can you change that to say I? Will you do that with me right now, everybody? If I am on the front lines for Jesus, I will be at the right place at the right time. Amen. God organizes our days. And He will organize our days. Well, the question is, where is your safe place? I want you to ask yourself, where is my safe place? On uh, Sunday, January 14th, 2018, there was this... Uh, that came up on people's Twitter account in um, Hawaii. Can you read it? Yeah. Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. Emergency alert. Well, one of my friends, he was a preacher at age 16. He's a Hawaiian national. And uh, he wrote this, he said, here at Camp Kawaka on the big island of Hawaii, I woke up this morning with a weird noise on my iPhone start stating that the ballistic missiles were launched and headed to Hawaii and that it was not a drill. I can't explain the mixed emotions, not knowing if my life would come to an end and if and uh, come to an end and Keila Thompson and the rest of the group uh, here, dropped to our knees and prayed. My heart was pounding inside, realizing that the life of my friends and family and my own would come to an end in a matter of minutes. I prayed that God would work a miracle, and even if he didn't at that, my heart would be right with him. And after my prayer, a sense of peace covered me, and I was comfortable to expect whatever happened. What broke my heart was the thought of not seeing my friends and family ever again, since many of them don't have a relationship with Jesus. Praise the Lord, it was a false alarm, and we never know when our life may come to an end. So let's dedicate all of it to God. Amen. Emergency alert, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter, this is not a drill. And for those of you that weren't familiar with it, I believe it was the governor, he could not find his password for Twitter to take this off. And so that went out. It was a mistake, but it surely affected everybody that was there. In fact, in the next week, my husband and I were in Hawaii. So our question again to you, where is your safe place? Are you going to find it like Diamond Garcia? Your safe place? One week later, we were actually in Hawaii, and of course, that uh, this was a Monday, but the Sabbath just before that, the um, pastor chose to speak about the false alarm, the ballistic missiles, and what would it mean? What would you do? What, what, what does that mean to your religious life? So here it is, the Monday after that sermon, the week and a couple days after the false alarm. Marty and I are up late, it's 11.56 p.m., we're on, on in Kanaapali, Kanaapali, Maui, Hawaii. And guess what comes through? There had been a uh, earthquake in Alaska. Now you'd think Alaska is pretty far away from Hawaii, but that's how tsunamis start with a little earthquake on the far side of the ocean. And a tsunami is a lot of waves that are going to come that come after an earthquake, and they can totally swallow up swallow up the whole, whole countryside oh, by the ocean. So here's me, you know, Marty says, well, I'm going to bed, and I'm saying, oh, uh, 
just kind of wonder what are you supposed to do in case of a tsunami alert in Hawaii and um, being islands and all uh, surrounded by the Pacific Ocean so I called the front desk and asked and she said well if it really is a tsunami alert what we'll do is we'll we'll tell you to go up to some higher floors <laughs> can you see where this is this is the ocean yeah, we were back here somewhere. We were going to go to a higher floor. <laughs> so I had to ask myself, where is my safe place? It was a viable threat. Fortunately, it uh, didn't come to pass. It petered out before it got over to Hawaii, as we say in, in uh, Ohio, where I grew up. So when you and I are asking ourselves a really important question, and the important question, okay, this is me just with a little clicker here, guys. Can you say it out loud to yourself? Where is my safe place? Where is my safe place? Thank you. That's a real deep question. Here we go. One more time. And the scripture that Bob read, with and without his glasses, Bob, that was awesome. I'd like us to say this one out loud, too. If you haven't got this memorized, you need to memorize this verse, wouldn't you say? Amen. Proverbs 18.10, everybody, let's say it together. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Amen. Now you look at that, that multi-level uh, hotel that we were in. And you'd think, that's a pretty strong tower, but not to a tsunami. Not to a tsunami. So this is a stronger tower than you can imagine. The name of the Lord. Let's say it. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and is safe. There's a qualification, isn't there? The righteous runs into it and is safe. And we know that there's only one set of space where we can find righteousness. Well, if you think about that uh, atomic radiation thing, it turns out that those uh, story of the fall, fallout shelters is partly a story about safety in the nuclear, nuclear age. Say it like Jimmy Carter, nuclear? Or was that Bush, you say nuclear? Nuclear age, but it's more about a placebo effect in times of panic. Because in a grimly practical way, the emotion of being inside was a pleasant reassurance of self-deception. There's a whole lot of folks out there counting on stuff that's not going to get the, not going to make it happen. Right. You can bury yourself underground. You can change uh, social media platforms. You can do all kinds of things, but it is not going to put you in a self place. Safe place is going to be self-deception. Right. So let's remember back where we started. Where we started. If you are on the front lines working for Jesus, front lines for Him, you'll be in the right place at the right time, right? Amen. I hope you can understand why that made me have some comfort. I hope it gives you some comfort too. Psalm 91, uh, it's a wonderful psalm. I love when B just stands up and just does the whole psalm. B's got that memorized and it's in his heart. I almost was going to call you and ask you to read it for us because you do it with such conviction. And he probably do it again before time goes. Psalm 91, verse 1 and 2. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Read it with me. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Most of the Almighty. The secret place of the Most High. There's a place. Wow. There's a place. Where's your safe place? Would you say this could be your safe place? The secret place of the Most High, but we got to figure out where that is, I would say. I, everybody, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. And that's uh, verse 2 of that wonderful psalm. Okay, now all the way down here to verse 14. This says, because he has set his love upon me, who's speaking? God's speaking. Therefore, I will deliver him. 
I will set him on high because he has known my name. We've got some conditional things going on here. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. So if you don't set your love upon him, you don't have the guarantee, right? You've got to meet the conditions to get the guarantee. And how do we get the conditions? Well, first of all, we, we especially in this congregation, we know that the righteousness of, of Christ is our only hope. Amen? Amen? The righteousness that came from the, the work that Jesus did on the cross for us. But because he has set his love upon me, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Now, here we go. In Joel 2.32 it says, And who shall ever, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be what? Now what does it mean to be delivered? That's kind of an old fashioned word. I should ask Indira what, in, what delivered means, but her mother delivered a baby. It, you did get delivered something that was started gets finished. So, and, and in this sense, some, some place that you're in trouble, you get out of the trouble, right? And you get delivered if you call on the name of the Lord. Is it like a magic trick? Is it like abracadabra? Hocus pocus? Total dependence. Ah, uh, you got an answer in the back. It said total dependence that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Let's look at this one. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. What happened on Mount Zion? <coughs> Big deal. What happened on Mount Zion? <laughs> Speak up. And what did you say also, Diamond? That's In Jerusalem, there was the crucifixion. Mount Zion, yes, Bob? I think we're getting our mountains all mixed up here. <laughs> Mount Zion is the, is the home of God. And um, when we think about what God's done for us through the Ten Commandments and through the cross, we can see that there's deliverance. Amen? Amen. And as the Lord has said, in, in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Are you, are you, are you, can you be part of the remnant today? Amen. Amen. We can be part of the remnant. And then in Acts 2.21, they pick that back up from what Joel said. And it says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wow. How precious is that? And for who and Romans 10, 13, they repeat it, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And they're getting that back from Joel. So is it a magic trick? Uh, no, I, I mean, when I say that, is it like uh, you just say the name and, and everything will happen for you, just poof. Well, sometimes it's about like that. There could be a person driving down the road and they may be a backslidden Christian and all of a sudden their car starts to spin up on the... Uh, on the overpass because it's a little icy because they're in Ohio and the next thing you know they start yelling out oh Lord Jesus please save me and, and forgive me all my sins happened to a friend of mine it's not the one who I was, whose hair I brushed this morning either so God can use it God can use it but it's deeper than that is it, amen can you say amen? amen let's see how much deeper it is we're going to go back to Psalm 91, verse 4, and under his wings. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall find protection. Where's your safe place? Under his, under his wings. We have a beautiful song like that. His, his faithfulness shall be your shield and wall. His faithfulness shall be your shield and wall. So now we're, we're depending upon what he is able to do, not on what we are able to do. You know, if you were walking with a little child, we used to play this thing called hoopla. You remember hoopla? <laughs> well, maybe they don't call it. In. Maybe I don't know what you call it in English. We call it hoopla in French. So the, the kids in, in the middle, the parents on one side, parents on the other side, and, and you go hoopla, the kid in the middle gets swung up in the air and then poof, back down on his feet. <laughs> you can play that. It's not called child abuse. What's it called, Donna? Oh, I don't oh we don't. Uh, oh, I don't you just remember it. Okay. I just want to say, woo. <laughs> woo. 
You're flying for a second, then you're back down on your feet. Hoop -a -la. And the question is, who's hanging on to who? The parent's hanging on to the child. You're, you're not counting on that child to hang on to the parent when, they, when you go out and play whoop -a -la. The parent's hanging on to the child. And I want you to remember that his faithfulness shall be your shield and wall. We can be faithful that he's hanging on to us. Even as much as we're hanging on to him, he's hanging on to us. And that's why you can go through these bumps of life. Well, I found this, somebody said this, uh, uh, and I, I totally stole it. I just thought, well, that's really true. I just got to share that with my friends. And here's what it says. It says, sometimes in life, it seems as though everything that could go wrong sometimes seems to do just that. That's Murphy's Law, isn't it? Everything that could go wrong does go wrong. But in reality, everything that could go wrong doesn't. You ever think about that side of it? It could be a whole lot worse. <laughs> and under the pressures and stresses of life's issues and circumstances at the time we're going through them, it seems that way. That everything that could go wrong is, is going wrong, but it's not really always the case. So that's something we need to remember as we put this together about where is your safe place? Where is my safe place? And here's a beautiful picture. I'm pretty sure, sure that that is, oh, I thought at first maybe it was a swan. It says, He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. Well, I wish you all had known my mom because she was a blast. She was a sort of fun. She'd do, hand, uh, do somersaults in the living room and hands the, uh, stand on her head and do all of her exercises. We, we thought she was a fun mom. And this is a story that she told, a joke basically, a parable, about a lady that was uh, in a Bible study class and she was, they were studying, what, what, what was the psalm that they were studying, folks? Everybody say it together. Psalm. See, I don't want you to forget it. Psalm 91. They were studying Psalm 91, and they were especially studying the verse 4. And in verse 4, it says, He will cover you with His feathers, and, and under His wings you will find refuge. So this lady was studying this, and then, remember, this is a parable. And she's going down the street, and all of a sudden, some guy jumps out, and he's trying to take her purse away. He's a purse snatcher, and she starts beating him and she's trying to remember the promises and she can't remember the whole thing and so she starts yelling feathers 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 <laughs> and the guy was didn't thought she was crazy he dropped her purse and went away <laughs> now that's a parable for you what you can't remember god will take and just help you with it right my mom thought that was so funny. Every once in a while we'd be in trouble and she'd just go, feathers, feathers, feathers. So now you've got a joke to put into your family and if somebody says feathers, you'll know why. You're calling on the help of the Lord. Psalm 91, under his wings he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall find protection. How close is that? You know, we have that expression that somebody took somebody under their wing. They mentored them, they guided them, they made sure that they were where they were supposed to be and, and helping them to try to figure out life. All right, but we're going to go back to these conditions. It says, he has set his love upon me. And I want to ask you, John 14, verse 15, it says this, if you what? Love me. Love me. Keep my commands. So if I love him, I will be keeping his commandments, and that means I have set my love on him. Ooh, now, I used to study about being in covenant relationship with God, because <clears throat> remember I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, at a school where they study a lot about that kind of stuff, and cutting a covenant with God. And when I found out that I had been ob observing only nine out of the ten commandments, I found myself ready to say, wow, I want to be in full accordance with what God has laid down. I, you know, society, churches, all that stuff, they, they kind of hid it from me. I, I, was, I grew up as a Methodist, and I was telling somebody about this just the other day. We would do confirmation when you're 11, 12 years old. You get sprinkled when you're baby, and then confirmation 11, 12 years old. We had a bunch of stuff to memorize. We had to memorize the Lord's Prayer. We had to memorize the... Uh, uh, Apostles' Creed, we had to memorize the 23rd Psalm, 
And they wanted us to memorize the Ten Commandments. And I said, hmm. I got down to the Fourth Commandment and said uh, about the seventh day, keep the seventh day holy. And I, I was smart enough to figure out that, that Sunday was not the seventh day. I mean, 11, 12 years old, you're not, you know, you can figure these things out. And I said, I hate memorizing. Why do they want me to memorize this when we're not doing it? Just saying. Just saying. 11, 12 years old. So if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, 15. I don't think I ever memorized it. I was stubborn. Um, but here we go.